Good morning. I'm uh, Max. I'm from the RIPE NCC. And uh, I'll be talking to you today about making the internet more secure. This is going to be a high-level introduction to what is being done, what's in the, what's in the works for uh, making the internet a better place for everybody. Because uh, the internet is changing, continues evolving, and it needs continuous work to, to make it a safe place for everybody. Before I start, I'll recommend you to pay attention because we'll have a similar quiz at the end with five questions. And so I have prize for the first one, prize for the second one, and prize for the third one. So this is a way to tell you, okay, heads up, don't look at your laptop, listen to the talk, learn something, hopefully, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll, we'll see if you can win something. So just a note before I start, I work at the RIPE NCC, uh, and I'll tell you what it is in a moment if you don't know that, but I'm not here officially from the RIPE NCC. The slides are from a talk that we've wrote together with other colleagues, but it's not given officially to you today. So I'm here as Max, not from the RIPE NCC officially. So what do we do? The RIPE NCC is one of the five regional registries. What do we do? We register things. We hoard IP addresses. We hoard IP addresses, <laughs> yes. What do, we, what do we register? Because registering is actually the best word for what we do. It's a registry. But why, why does the RIPE NCC exist? Register autonomous systems. But again, the word, register. What do we need it for? Why do we have to register something? Exactly, because one entity, one organization, needs to have unique IP addresses. Otherwise, you end up in the same situation some people ran into when they started using uh, in, internally to their network with a carrier grade NAT. They thought, oh, I see these networks are not being used by anybody on the internet, uh, five slash eight, and they started using them internally. And then they found out that their customers couldn't reach some other networks in the world because they were using somebody else's address space. So the registries are needed because somebody needs to keep track of all these things. So to compete with the talk in the other room, do you know who started all this? Let's talk about history a little bit. <laughs> you know who started all this? Because this is the evolution, the idea that will be important for for the rest of the talk. Exactly. John Postel. Oh. He started calling himself the Ayana and started writing on a notebook, hardware one, real notebook, IP addresses. Like who is getting what? And he did it in California. He was working at UCLA and started taking care of registering who was using what. And at the time, if somebody called, even from Europe, you would call physically, call John, and ask for IP addresses. And John would give you, depending on your size, slash 16, slash 24, or slash 8. Because there wasn't classless addressing like we have today. You had either one, two, or three. Pick one. The yeah, A, B, or C, yes, but one, two, or three, it was like, choose one. Which, how big are you? Uh, I don't know, but choose one. What do you want, a slash eight, a slash 16, or a slash 24? So this, this was because they thought, at the time, the internet wouldn't become what we have today. But then in 1992, somebody in Europe decided, okay, we need something here. And I always try to attribute this to the lazy Italians who didn't want to wake up at night to call John Postel in, in, uh, in the US. So they started RIPE, Réseau Epé Européen, French, uh, when French was a cool language still. <laughs> then they added NCC. You know, Réseau means networks, 
European IP networks, basically. And then NCC stands for Network Coordination Center. So we repeat our, ourselves in the name. Anyway, we are part of a larger group. We are a not-for-profit organization. Our office is actually, we couldn't find a perfect picture of our office, but our office is actually this building here on the edge. <laughs> so it's just that. And actually, not even that, because we don't, we don't have any part of that office in, that's, in that corner, we're actually here. So if you look for the post office when you're in the city center in Amsterdam, you'll actually get to our office, because it used to be the main post office. Anyway, we are a not-for-profit organization, and we have 13,000 members. Members who can just register. You can be a single person, registered by yourself, or you can be a large organization. So we have both uh, organizations such as IBM, Deutsche Telekom, and single persons becoming members. Anybody can do that. Anybody can become a member. Anybody can just get his or her own resources. I told you we are a, a network of five regional registries. So you might know that here in North America, you have Erin. So I will try to pick some of the differences between how things are done in Europe and how things can be done in the US during this talk. Then you have LACNIC, you have AFRINIC, and you have APINIC. A little bit of history. 1992 was when the RIPNCC was created. The region at the time was actually much bigger than this. We already have the biggest region in terms of countries, 76. You know there was, Africa was di divided into two parts. One was RIPNCC and one was, do you have any idea? Erin. So Erin used to manage IP addresses for South Africa as well, the southern part of Africa. The division was made, and this is a nice historical thing. There's a fiber that cuts Africa in two parts. And that was the way geeks decided, let's define how Africa can be divided. <laughs> There's a fiber path in here. Let's do that. So northern Africa was ripe, and southern Africa was Erin. Then in 2006, Afrinic was started. Then, what do we do? We do, we give you IP addresses if you want them, we give you IPv6 addresses, we give you it, autonomous system numbers, but what else does the RIPNCC do for the good of the internet? I have one. I have more here. We have RIP Atlas. Because we have 13,000 members and they all pay a membership fee every year, so we have to justify what they pay. Not only for IP addresses, we have to do something to show them, oh, we're here, we're needed. But we do this, RIP Atlas. It's a project where you can host one of the probes, we send it out to you for free, and you get uh, to become part of the biggest measurement system for the internet. You can then run your own measurements. You host a probe, you get points, and you can run your own measurements. But let me go on, because I don't want this to become uh, a talk about what the RIP NCC does. We, you can go and find it out by yourself. The other thing we do is run KROOT, and this is the last thing I'll tell you. We run KROOT, the root DNS server. Now, the agenda. What am I going to tell you about today? I'm going to tell you about new TLDs, because things are changing also in the in names not only numbers we don't not only we have ipv6 we have stuff changing in dns as well we have dnssec ipv6 and then we have routing with rpki bgpsec homenet which is not really a security protocol but it's going to change a lot in our houses so this is what we're going to talk about today so let repeat with me the internet is a dangerous place why is it changing? Why is it dangerous and why is it changing? Because we have people, because we have devices, because every device needs an IP address. Every device needs to reach the internet and the internet is a dangerous place. So we have to pay attention. It has become a critical part of our lives. We all depend on it. I mean, when I'm traveling and I cannot access Google or 
Facebook, and I can't see kittens where I am. I feel a bit lost, I have to say. So, thing, the internet is part of our lives. We have applications that we couldn't even think about five, ten years ago. I've gotten to know that trains in the, in, in the German system now require 32 addresses per seat. Every seat needs 32 addresses. Why? Well, comfort services, you know, they have a, a system where you, you try to find your seat and actually you have to look up and check your name on the seat because there's a central system that dispatches the names of the people who booked the seat. So you see who's sitting there. They have sensors that tell the, um, the, the train conductor if you're sitting at your seat or not. So they know how much capacity the train has live. And not only the address has to be unique on the train, it has to be unique on the whole system. All across Germany and actually neighboring countries because trains from, from that part of the world travel in Switzerland, Italy, well, I hope for them not, uh, France, Belgium, Netherlands, and so on, Poland, and so on. So we need all these changes because we come up with different ideas. So first of all, the TLDs, names. You know, we used to have a simple world with dot coms, with all the, na the generic TLDs, dot com, dot org, dot net, dot info, biz name, this was the first uh, wave of new TLDs. Then we have the country code TLDs, .ch, .nl, Saudi Arabia. Then there's a list of .io, those little islands in the middle of uh, nowhere that found out, oh, we can make money with domain names. And also, for example, Montenegro. Who knows Montenegro? What the country code for Montenegro? Ha, .me. They're making lots of money just because they, they were so lucky to get .me from their country code. So they're making lots of money just because of that. And then we have infrastructural uh, top level domains. .arpa and .ip6 for reverse in IPv6. Don't ask me why it's just IP6. I don't know, I don't wanna know. We keep on seeing requests to us for IP, IPv6 delegations, dot .IPv6 delegations, but it's IP6. I don't know why, I don't wanna know. But then things changed. And the one on the top is dot .iran. The one below that, I have no idea. <laughs> this one, I have no idea either. I just copy and pasted them. But these are valid top level domain names. I'm happy they're coming, we're coming up with this. I have a colleague who registered a nice domain name in hieroglyphics. Then he doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> no, that, that's not true. But then you get into the trouble of telling somebody, okay, how can you send me an email to that address? Or we, we cover, as you could see, the Middle East. So, Sometimes I go to the Middle East and I get business cards and they have something like that written. Can you send me an email to this address? I can't do copy and paste and from a business card. So I have no idea how to send you an email. I'm sorry. Or actually I have a few dot family domain names for my family name, my girlfriend's family name and so on. And I offer free uh, mailboxes to whoever has the same uh, surname. The problem is, if you try calling, if they call you from a customer service, whatever, and they ask you your email address and you tell them stuki.family and they go, what the hell? What is that? Because it doesn't fit in their scheme of how a domain name is made. And then on top of this, you have all the fake domains that are being registered because the idea of having domain names, the idea of extending the TLD namespace was to make sure that we would have new space for new entrants, new namespace for new entrants, new people who set up new companies and they couldn't find a viable .com, .net, .biz domain. So we started expanding it and making it bigger. But bigger doesn't mean that it's going to be more secure. 
It means that I can register more domain names with fake names to go to people and trick them into buying my services, which maybe they don't want. So this, is, this doesn't make it all more secure. So we don't know. And you have new TLDs with whatever you want, whatever you would like. You know, I was so fascinated when the, an Italian company that everybody hates in Italy actually won the auction against uh, um, Amazon and Google to get dot .cloud. And in Italy, we were all looking at it like, how could it be possible? How did they win against them? It's just a matter of how much you bid for getting your top level domain. So these are things that are changing over the internet. And then we have, whoa, where is this? Oh yes, the delegated TLDs. We have so many now. We have more than 1,200, 1,200 of these. And they're all going to change our lives for the good or, or the worse, we don't know. But then the internet is a dangerous place. So how can we verify that all these information are going to be true? We can do it with DNSSEC. How many of you have a DNSSEC signed domain name? I knew, I knew that. I mean, I knew only three of you would have that. <laughs> Why? Where's the problem with DNSSEC? Yes? Uh, that's not entirely true. If you have one of the new TLDs, it's mandatory for them to give you DNSSEC. Maybe it's the registrars that are not enabled for you to send them information because you have to do, let me go a bit ahead, you have to create a chain of trust in DNS, which means you need to create what's called a DS record. It's a new type of record. You have to create it on your, um, on your parent zone. So in this case, this is ripe.net. Um, don't try doing it now, but don't open ripe.org, okay? Don't do that. Don't check it. We, we have .net, don't try to do that. So we have ripe.net and we have .NET here, so we have DNS key and DS records. We have to create a chain of trust, so we have specific records in DNS where we, public, we publicly give all our data about keys and about signatures. So we add the layer on top of DNS to create a chain of trust. So we can then verify what we get as an answer from our queries. DNSSEC doesn't provide crypto, doesn't encrypt anything in reality. I mean, my queries still go <clears throat> plain text. It's just that I get my query and I get a way to verify what I, what I got. So in reality, DNSSEC doesn't, where is it, doesn't prevent me doesn't prevent attacks, doesn't prevent some many kinds of attacks. It only covers some of the cases. It doesn't do everything. If I want, if I have a resolver, my resolver that does DNSSEC for me, does DNSSEC validation for me, but my resolver is on the other side of the country, my query and my answer still has to travel across the path from me to the resolver and from the resolver to me, in which it could be modified still. So there are ways to overcome this limitation. You can run your own resolver on your own laptop. You can run your own resolver on your local network, but still it requires some work. So this is how you would see a DNS query. This is stripped a bit, but this is for a quad A record, IPv6, for ripe.net, and this is what you get as the signature for the record. This is what you get for the name servers as well. So every record in DNSSEC gets signed, and then you can validate the signatures. So far, so good. Yes, I'm not going to go into those that many details anymore about DNSSEC. If you want, in the hallway, I'm happy to answer all your questions on it. But then what can we do 
once we have a chain of trust, we can trust what we get from DNS. We can, we can say, oh, whatever I got here is what I wanted, is my answer. So I can start enabling applications that leverage the fact that I can get data from DNS, I can trust. First of all, Dane, certificate pinning. In Dane, I have a TLSA record. I have my certificate hash. And basically, what I do is my client, this is made much, much, much simpler than it is in reality, just for um, explanation purposes. My client gets the certificate from the web server and then gets the same information, the certificate hash, from DNS. So I have two ways to verify what I got. And then I can avoid going through all the CAs, certificate authorities, because my certificate can be validated using two different sources. This, uh, I was giving a DNSSEC course in, in Iran, for example, and they said this is, the, this is going to be the best thing for them ever because they can't buy certificates because all, they all come from a US company, US organization. So they can't buy certificates legally. They can now use self-signed certificates for running their own web servers there. They don't have to buy anything. You can do that as well using Dane. And then you can use it for verifying SSH host keys as well. There's a specific dedicated uh, new record type for SSH fingerprints. Done. You have them in DNS. You look into, you get the, the key from, uh, from your, the server you're connecting to. You verify it with DNS. Great. Done. I can check from two sources as well. So this way, and it's already supported in, uh, in, op uh, in um, OpenSSH, I can be safer going over the internet. But the problem is, how is DNSSEC deployed in the world? There you go. Pretty much everybody. And again, I always blame my country, my home country, but Italy is just yellow. But pretty much everywhere, DNSSEC is enabled, then if your registrar doesn't support it, then try talking to another registrar. Or we can discuss, we can check together if you want to. So it's doable, it's, it's out there, please check it. So I'll move over to talk about IPv6. And I'm, I'm going to say the same things I've been saying for years now. I mean, 2011, the RIPE NCC received the very last bits of address space from IANA, the last slash eight, as, uh, as it's called. Sorry? No. Um, no, because there was a policy, a global policy, where uh, whenever some of one of the RIRs would request the last slash eight, which let the pool of slash eights go, uh, well, reach five, then every RIR in the world would get one. It was called a fair run out policy, basically. So, <clears throat> so the RIP NCC, there was a ceremony received, uh, yes, in a ceremony in Miami. So we have a nice, um, how do you call it, uh, glass. I don't know how to, name, to call it anyway. So we have a piece of glass with 185 slash 8 written on it, and we have it in the office. And that's the very last slash 8 we received from Ayana. So in 2011, we got that. But we still had other address space. Then in 2012, a year later, we have a picture in the office where my colleague, a colleague of mine, pushed the button to make the last allocation from the semi-last slash eight we had available. And then we started, we entered a new policy, uh, a new time in the, in the history of the, of the regional registries. Now, in, uh, now, I will tell you the differences between how it works in 
Europe and how it works here for Erin. In Europe, if you, have, if you uh, open a new company, the policy tells you, you can become a member and you will get 1 slash 22. Independently, if you, if you come and tell us you already have 100 million customers or you're just starting up and it's a one-man business, we will give you 1 slash 22, 1,000 addresses. Those are supposed to be addresses that you use to start and then you can move on later on. But at least you get something you can start with and it's a very low uh, entry point. The cost of membership is 1,400 euros a year plus 2,000 for startup. And then you have to keep your addresses before you can transfer them for two years. So we have started this and the idea for having this policy was that at the time the RIPE NCC had 8,000 members. In a slash 8 you have uh, 16,000 slash 22s. So the idea was everybody can get one and then we leave space for 8,000 new members for the rest of the time of the, of the regional registry. So it was meant to be a fair way of guaranteeing new entrants with enough address space to start at least. The difference with Aaron is that Aaron didn't get such a policy and Aaron ran out of addresses in, June, in January. Sorry. So if you are a new business in North America, you have to get into a waiting list to get IP addresses because this is the remaining address pool for the RIPE NCC because the, every six months you can see the actually the addresses in the pool have grown since 2012 actually since 2014 because there is a global policy where Ayana recovers address space from legacy basically whatever John Postel had assigned to somebody and that somebody is not using them anymore they try to chase that person or organization if they can't make it they reclaim the space and then every six months that space is given back to the regional registries and those are the spikes you see here those are IPv4 addresses that got into the pool of, of available addresses in the ripe region now this also happens to Erin of course um, I think this was a slash 13 then 14 15 and then 16 so every six months regional registries get a smaller chunk of address space smaller and smaller every time and that's it so every every six months there will be somebody in Erin who's on the waiting list and will be able to get addresses the others on the waiting list they'll have to wait there's, there's a lot of discussion going around on the way the RIPE policy is because people think it's not fair, because people think uh, they should get more addresses. We don't know. Uh, the way it is right now guarantees that people can join, can get addresses and at least start the business. But what can you do with IP addresses? They have a value. They have a value between $10 and $14 each. So now don't make calculations on how many addresses you have and how much money you're sitting on. Okay? <clears throat> but you can transfer them. You can transfer addresses. How does it work? You can transfer them between members, and that's the same for RIPE and Erin. You can transfer them through a merger or acquisition. And since the internet is not a safe place, sometimes this is used for transferring addresses, saying, oh, I bought that other company, I want their addresses. This is used from legacy space or inter-RIR. You can have an inter-RIR transfer. Move addresses from a regional registry to the other. There needs to be an agreement, so only three types are possible. Between APNIC and ARIN, between ARIN and RIPE, and between RIPE and APNIC. The other two registries, not possible at the time, because the two registries need to have compatible policies. 
to transfer addresses. And of course, you know, Afrinix still has lots of IP addresses. They still have uh, almost two slash eights available. So they don't want to open that to transfers to other regions at the moment because the internet is a dangerous place and things can go wrong. So you can either transfer addresses and or run a cater grade NAT. And how many of you are customers of ISPs who have a cater grade NAT? A few. Yeah. You work for one. Okay, what are the problems for you? You have a cater grade NAT. Okay. Yeah. Or, or depending on what applications they are running, they might run into troubles. Okay. But my question is, how much administrative burden do you have because of that? Okay. That's a good news, actually. Okay. Because uh, do you have requirements? You're here. You're based uh, in the U.S. or Canada. In Ottawa. In Ottawa. Okay. What are the requirements if you run a carrier grade NAT? Data retention. How is that? Yeah, well, that's something we, we, we just implemented this in a public demo okay. with the um, tracking all the NAT transfers to things like Cloudflare so that it can work with the existing network. Yeah. Because there's a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. So you have to do that, and at least in the EU, the requirements are to save the data on a local storage for six months and then move it to a remote storage and keep it for five years. So it has to be retrievable for the next five years because the police from any one of the other member states can even come and ask you, okay, who was doing what at the four years ago at this time of the day, and we want to know. So Please tell us. But the internet is a dangerous place. And IP addresses have a value between $10 and $14. So what happens every single day on the internet? We have hijacks. People who start using somebody else's address space or people who claim to be somebody else faking papers faking registration uh, um, papers, faking stamps, everything, everything happens because IP addresses have such a high value at the moment and the value is only increasing that they try to make anything possible to, to, do, to get those, to get them. So IPv6 is getting there. This could solve many of these issues because IPv6 addresses don't have a value. There are so many, their value is so low that none of that would have any sense to hijack somebody else's address space. Wouldn't really have sense unless you have a specific reason for doing that. Very, very, very specific. But addresses, not one of them in this case. So we have 42, more than 42% of traffic over IPv6 in Belgium. Belgium has a particular history. They have an IPv6 task force and they have two big telcos in the country. They were sitting in the IPv6 task force and one of the two started saying, oh, we will implement IPv6 in nine months in our network. And the other one felt compelled to say something and they said, oh, no, 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 we will do it in six months. So the first one felt, oh, if they can do it in six, we can do it in three. So they claimed they would do that in three months. And then they all agreed that in three months they would both have IPv6 running and that's what happened. So the goal is for them in a few months to have more than 50% of the Belgian traffic over IPv6. That's happening. US is at 27%. How many of you have IPv6 at home? At home, running. Well, sorry? 
not in US, you're in Germany. You're in Germany, I know. Canada? Yes. Then where does that 27% come from? Because you didn't make up for a quarter of the room. Where does that come from? Yeah, but uh, how? No, you said that. Cell phones, mobile operators. Because mobile operators are running out of addresses and they have no other option. So they implement NAT64. NAT64 gives them the ability to give your phone just IPv6 only and then NAT you into IPv4 if you need that. So that's where all that 27% of traffic comes from. Because it's Facebook, YouTube, basically and Netflix going over IPv6 from your mobile phone. Then you have 8% in Canada and more than 10% in France, Germany, UK, Switzerland, Peru. The only spot in South America. And you know why? Well, this is not going, this doesn't need to go really public, but well, Peru is the test trial for Telefonica de España, the Spanish phone company. They're trying IPv6 in Peru, see how it goes, and then they bring it in the country. So this is happening. This is all happening. This is how the traffic is going. Traffic is going up. We have a total 12% of traffic over IPv6 in the world right now. But the internet is a dangerous place. So we need routing, we need to change it, and we need to add crypto to something that's already so complicated that a handful of people actually understand it in the world. Are you talking about GCP? Also, yes, that's what I'm talking about. So we have had incidents in the past, and I guess many of you heard about YouTube and Pakistan Telecom. Pakistan Telecom apparently fat fingering a configuration file and starting to announce YouTube's uh, address space. So what they did was for two hours, YouTube was completely down all over the world because they, uh, their provider, the provider from Pakistan Telecom, their Tire One ISP, didn't have any filters enabled, got all the information from them, replicated it all over the world, and YouTube was taken offline for two hours, basically. This was a nice one. A nicer one was an afternoon, which I still remember from some years ago, where someone in Czech Republic was configuring a new device they got, and it was a nice new Microtik router. You know. So they wanted to do a prepend in, IP, in BGP. They set a prepend, and, they, and they, that's what they wanted to set. Actually, you don't do it this way in Microtik, you do it this way. You set just the number of prepends, and you don't set the string you want to prepend. But that's what they did because they didn't run the manuals, apparently. So, uh, yes, I understand. But then the rest of 47,868 divided by 256, because, of course, overflows, the rest was 252. And that's, what the num that's the number of prepends that actually they set in Microtik. So their AS path was prepended 252 times. And whoever was more than three AS numbers away from them would have their sessions reset all afternoon long until you found out, oh, those guys in Czech Republic. And it took a whole afternoon for us to find out. Yes, Cisco devices. But imagine I have, I have a whole plethora of, Cis of Cisco devices where the sessions keep on resetting. And even if I have a, a Juniper device downwards, then the, the changes in my topology will trigger my, um, how's it called, the uh, BGP dampening, flat dampening. So go on, fun for a whole afternoon. And then, Somebody, this is more recent, 2012, I think. Uh, it was only noticed after a couple of years. 
analyzing some BGP feeds from that day because of other issues. And I found out that for an afternoon, all the traffic that was amongst other networks, it was like 200 different networks, had their whole traffic redirected to, uh, well, to uh, somewhere in Kiev and then back to their destinations. And amongst them, there was the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment, a fun network, I can imagine. So we only found out by accident, we, the community found out by accident, only some time later, not that day, because nothing changed, nobody noticed. It went unnoticed for the whole, for a whole three, six, 12 months, I don't remember exactly, but this happened and we don't know why and we don't know for what reason. So, yeah, even transferring IP addresses is risky. Sometimes you get addresses that are being used by somebody else. It happens. Or maybe you don't get the real person selling them. That happens. That's why there are brokers. Or you can get unused address space that somebody thought was unused and then tried to sell it to you. This happens because the internet is a dangerous place. And then you have geolocation that doesn't get updated. I have a friend in Italy who decided to buy a network from Iran a few years ago. And for a whole year, his customers couldn't go to YouTube, couldn't go to Google, couldn't go to all the American websites because they were just firewalled out. So it takes a long time when you do that because people have to keep other people outside of networks because the internet is a dangerous place. There you go. There you go. Geolocation takes time to update because it's more of an art than a specific science. And then spammers need addresses as well. So what they do is try to find unused address space over the internet. And they try to start announcing it. So this is a scheme from a whole, uh, over a, the course of an afternoon, where you can see that there's address space. These are different networks. And these are spammers. And what they're doing is, they identified a slash 16 that nobody was using, apparently. And they take, they started with a quick BGP announcement. Let's see if somebody notices. And then when they found out everything was fine, so okay, let's move to the next one, to the next five, six networks, start announcing them, spam everything we can out of it. And then when we find out that the blacklists got us, move to the next one. And they kept on doing it for the whole afternoon. This happens every day. This happens every day. Because the internet is a dangerous place. And how can we fix this? BCP38, best common practices. Does anybody know what they involve? Yeah? Exactly. Set, set up appropriate filtering between you, your upstreams, and your downstreams first. Then filter out the bogons, all the bogons, all the networks that are not supposed to be on the internet, filter them out. So things like the one from the, um, from the previous slide don't happen. And then what else? RPF, reverse path forwarding. So I have a... There's a specific command in uh, uh, all the uh, router vendors where I tell the router, check that you have a route. When you receive a packet over an interface, check you have a route that corresponds to where that packet comes from. Make sure you have it. You can have two modes. One is strict RPF, well, where, I, where you, you want to make sure that the packet you receive is for, from a network that you will 
reach through that specific interface. If it comes in from a different interface, mm -mm, not accepting it. Second, uh, loose mode is I just make sure I have a route for that network in my, in my routing table. Then with this, a lot, of, a lot of these incidents will not happen. And then we have RPKI. We have also BGPSec. We have everything. How does RPKI work? I have to go quicker, I think. RPKI tell, gives me the ability to answer a question. Where, does, where is this network supposed to come from? Who is supposed to be originating this network? And how do I do that? I do that with the original registries, as it is implemented right now. Anybody could run RPKI on their own, but the easiest way is to do it through your regional registries. In my, the regional registries create what's called a ROA, root origin authorization. The ROA is just a file that tells me this AS number is supposed to be announcing this network up to this prefix. That's it. And then I sign it, I sign it and I make it available with a whole chain of trust that's walkable over different servers. So all the regional registries operate servers that where you can pull off all the ROAs, all the certificates that are have to be created by the uh, networks, by the owners of the networks, by the operators. In the RIPE region, it's basically three clicks over a web interface. You need your own username and password. We give them to every member. You just go there, three clicks. And it's not that much difficult in Erin either. So you go there and you create those. And then you run a whole, you run a software inside your network. There's one implementation at the moment from, unfortunately, well, from the RIPE NCC. But uh, basically that software gets all the ROAs from all the five regional registries, tries to walk the chain of trust. If that works, the ROA is considered valid, and then it's put into a validated cache. And then the routers have a protocol called RTR, RPKI RTR, where they ask the validator, give me all the valid ROAs you have. Let me know. And then whenever the router receives an update in BGP, the router checks the ROAs. Do I have a valid ROA for this announcement? Does the ROA contain the same autonomous system that's, that I see here in BGP? Oh no, it doesn't. Okay, so the ROA is insecure at this time. And if it's insecure, I can take my routing decisions. I can either drop the route or give it a um, lower preference or I can do whatever I want. But I can make an educated guess at what I have. And then my router will take more time to process my BGP feed, of course, it will. But it will be, it will make everything more secure. And on top of this, we have the next step, BGP sec. Because I told you, the ROAs only certify the beginning of my AS path. But whatever happened to the UK weapons and atomic whatever, was just a redirection of the traffic. I wouldn't see much difference if I were just using RPKI to see those routing hijacks. Somebody else is looking at, at the traffic. With BGPSec, sorry for the wall of text here, with BGPSec, I, I certify the whole AS path because every router in the middle takes the routing announcement when it adds its own AS number, it, uh, it assigns the whole announcement and signs the information in there. So it, or the whole AS path has, is a, basically a chain of trust that I can walk and I can verify whenever I receive an announcement. And I can check that what happened in the path is what, I, what was supposed to happen. So BGPSec adds on top of RPKI because it starts from RPKI, but it gives me a validation of the whole chain. So with that, I can make everything a little bit more secure. 
and this is much it. Because last, I'm going to talk about HomeNet. Has anybody ever heard of it? Yes, there's a working group in the ITF. This is probably not going to make your internet more secure, but it's going to make your life easier. Uh, because in HomeNet, one of the main features is that I have a router, and my router has five, seven, 20 switch ports in the back. And up until now, you had to connect the, the WAN on the WAN port, the LAN on the LAN ports, and so on. With HomeNet, this goes away. So I can make my mom happier because I can tell her that she can connect everything she wants on every port she wants. Because HomeNet makes it easier to identify what's the outside interface and the inside interface. If there's a DHCP v6 speaking, it's an outside interface. If it's not, nothing. It's an internal interface. But what does it add to me? Why, why does it add a little bit of security to my networks? It's because with HomeNet, imagine we have a house and we get the slash 56 for the house and this is just IPv6 because HomeNet was built with IPv6 in mind. Basically every segment inside my network in my house gets a different slash 64, a different local network. And everything happens at layer three between all these networks. So I can set up firewalling. I can have different sections in my home network. And that makes things a little bit more secure for everybody. Because I can set rules on my local little router that are getting more and more powerful every day so that I can filter out whatever I want. So HomeNet was defined in RFC 7788 with two internal routing protocols. One is uh, uh, DNCP and one is uh, Babel, Babel, Bubble, whatever. So internally to my house, I run routing protocols at this time, at this point. So things should be a little bit more secure with HomeNet as well. And I hope you don't have any questions. If you don't have any questions, then I can start with, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the hitting it mm -hmm. and central system yep. because Okay, how can how does BGP sec how can BGP sec influence black holing black holing? Yes. Um, it depends on how you uh, consider the black black holing. If it's internally to your AS number, then uh, BGP sec doesn't happen there. BGP sec only happens when you have an eBGP peer. In iBGP uh, BGPSec adds uh, information into the AS path, but it's, you know, it, it doesn't fill in, it doesn't add anything in the AS path. You're basically signing the AS path. So in IBGP, that doesn't change because it's all the internal uh, area. So in, if you're talking about internal black holing, that's fine. Because you redirect to a different host, you redirect to something. In, if you think about black holing, I mean, for a country or for a larger scale, um, um, it's actually a good question that I, I hadn't thought about. Yes, but but at the same time, no, but at the same time, how uh, the question is, how do you implement black holing at a country level in this case using BGP? Mm -hmm. with, I don't remember one of the assumptions for black holders at the time was okay. and it had um, I had a super USA and five from New York and we had a QM like again one server in the USA okay in the, in the meantime I'm listening to you I'm just going yeah. over to the quiz anyway, it's open source black hole by mm. whoever made the decision on all the tables and um, our internet provider data center provider in the USA said we cannot do anything Like 
Okay. Okay. Because the black holing can be used in communities, so you can have a speci specific community telling you black hole this, then you apply a root map to filter that, or generally censorship happens in some countries where you have to, to, to have all your data go uh, flow through the um, uh, government's network, so your only upstream is going to be the, uh, the government. So in that case, uh, you could disable BGPSEC for that peer, because generally you would have that peer that gives you all the networks that you would have to filter, and then BGPSEC in that case you would be, you would be disabling it for, for that filter, for that, for that particular peer. So that's the way I think I would do that. Okay. But then it doesn't have any influence on, on you. Basically, what you can do also with RPKI is write your own rules to treat what becomes invalid, standing by the ROAS, what, what is being announced, let's say, from a, um, um, an AS number that's not supposed to be announcing that, uh, that network. Uh, so you can filter it out or you can give it a lower preference. It depends on how your network is designed and how you want to treat those. Because consider that, uh, I, well, you, you give me a good case. In, in Germany, there was a big telco which wanted to do their own RPKI some time ago. And the problem was that they couldn't, I don't remember what was the issue then, but they would show up, all their networks, and there were, there were quite a few, they would show up as invalid in RPKI. But that, that would have meant that if you were filtering directly, looking at that, just at that data, you would have taken your customers out from talking to that telco. And I can assume it's a big, I can, assume, I can, I can tell you it was a big one in the country. So things can happen and things can go wrong with RPKI and with BGPSEC because BGPSEC depends on RPKI. Um, the problem is how are we going to deal with it? And we still don't know because it's, uh, everything is relatively new. At the moment, we only have a handful of, uh, of ROAs being signed, rpki.surfnet.nl. And if we, check, if we check the RPKI dashboard, and if it decides to open up, yeah, there you go. Um, if you check the RIR stats, you'll see that if I make them, yay, if I make them bigger, well, probably you don't see it from there, but I have just 20% of the, of the routes in uh, RIPE are, in LACNIC are, are uh, certified. They have a ROA and 11% in the RIPE NCC. That's 3% and less than 1% in ARIN. So we still have a long way before you can, still, you can start trusting the system and before we can start thinking of, oh, what can we do with these issues? Because at, at present, you can't use RPKI, unfortunately, for uh, deciding who's good and who's bad. Only when... Only when those numbers, only when those numbers reach 95, 98 percent, we can start saying, "Okay, um, let's take routing decisions based on this." You're welcome. Yeah. Well, it's sometimes it's because people don't know, and we, for example, the. We take an active part as RIPE NCC in this, where we give trainings. And actually, the reason why you see 19% adoption by LACNIC is because they have put an enormous amount of effort into making this a reality. So you have lots of stuff happening there. But in, uh, in uh, RIPE, you see we have 11%, but it's actually more networks than LACNIC to, that are certified. Uh, it will take time. It will just take time because people have to know People have to go under a, a hijack before they realize, oh, what can I do for that? And I can go and take, take action and s set up RPKI. Yeah. So if you all uh, agree, I will move to the, where is it, to the quiz. It's just five questions. It will take a minute. 
And then you can get a couple prizes. Uh, Kahoot.it. And that's the pin number. Sorry? Oh, uh, I don't know how to get the cats. You all set? So I'll start the quiz. It's about what I talked about today. It's five questions. Just be the quickest one. It's easy. We'll get a validated response. Who said, well, we'll be slower. I could accept it because it takes a longer time to process them. But please, no. Don't come up with that. Please, no. OK, who is zero? Yay. Ah, Kajetan, Mary, good. Next, transferring IP ad IPv4 addresses. This is tricky. I want to see if anybody answered can make me rich. <laughs> well done, well done, well done. Uh, OK, OK, next. When is IPv6 going to be adopted? You can stop the recording if you want. <laughs> there you go. It's already being adopted. I like the two people who want to uh, want IPv4 to live forever. <laughs> of course it will. Yes. Very little effort to be set up. Well, who wants to jump through fire? <laughs> OK, this is going to be the last question. You're all pretty close. The first uh, three are pretty close for a chance of winning one of the prizes. HomeNet requires. Who wants a new car? Great, great. So who was faster? Let's see. Eric's. <laughs> so you get a nice, uh, come over. This was the last question. So Eric's, come over. You get a um, laptop bag and a mug. There you go. Thank you for coming. Then second was, I don't remember. Hey, I want the final results. There you go. Benno. Yay. Then you get, you get a travel adapter as well. There you go. And then third, Kifto. 
Here you go. So you get a USB stick and a um, business card holder. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.